Uh, can you hear me? Yes. So I am told I am the chair of this session. Um, I'm also presenting in this tutorial. So I have decided we are starting now. Um, so this is joint work um, with a number of people who are here. I'm going to be presenting sort of the first part, and my uh, collaborator, Sue Lin, who's in the front row, is going to be sort of taking on um, sort of the second half. Uh, this is also joint work with Solon Barokas, uh, Hal Domey, and Hannah Wallach. And this is based on, nope. All right. Uh, <laughs> hmm. <laughs> All right. No, it, it, it worked before. Uh, as I said, it was my decision to start now, and so. <laughs> All right, we're based on two pieces of work. So thank you again for coming to our tutorial on the meaning and measurement of bias. Um, this is work based on two papers. Um, one of them is already online, Measurement and Fairness. Um, that's work uh, by me and Hannah Wallach. This is on archive. And Debunking Debiasing, a critique of bias measurement in NLP. And that will be posted online soon, so I'm excited for you to all read it. Um, but I really wanted to start with some basic assertions about things that we think are true across um, this conference and more broadly. There are some things that we care about. Um, it might be that we care about creditworthiness or having a good teacher, um, someone who's a risk to society, or using toxic or bullying language. Um, we might even care about fairness. Again, I'm just asserting this, but I would also like to assert that these are inherently unobservable theoretical constructs. Um, we might have some kind of deep uh, sociological or philosophical theory behind them, some folk wisdom, but these are inherently unobservable without coming up with some kind of way to represent these in the real world. And so, in fact, the theme of this tutorial is that if we want to measure the unobservable, we must necessarily operationalize the construct, say, fairness or creditworthiness, with a, what I will introduce as a measurement model. And so this gives us a way to take observations from the real world and help us reason about these ideas that are, um, in fact, never going to be observable. And this is a really, you know, beautiful, simple process. And in fact, it sort of underlies almost everything that we do. So if we have some construct like teacher quality and we want to um, decide on some sort of theoretical fixed understanding of what we believe teacher quality to be, we can then say, okay, this is what teacher quality is. Quality means they help their students improve and learn. I might choose to operationalize that with uh, test scores. And then using observed test scores from year to year, I can then assert that I am measuring teacher quality. And you might have some problems with that model. You might have some problems with those assumptions. But that process, regardless of the steps along the way, gives us a framework for thinking about the choices that we've made. And in fact, we can see this across a range of different topics. This is just, you know, some highlights. We can think about creditworthiness. Later, we'll talk a little bit about tweet toxicity. Um, and we think, can think about how we would turn that into certain kinds of, say, scores or um, a decision about whether or not you get kicked off a platform. And so, again, we sort of have this underlying process that we're going to operationalize this underlying thing. But when we think about fairness, when we think about teacher quality, when we think about toxic language, we're necessarily encoding our organizational or cultural or political or economic or social values um, into those decisions. And that's actually sort of fundamental to the construct level of what we believe these constructs to be in the first place. And so we're actually able to better unpack where those values enter into our assumptions and our models, as well as um, recover back where they came from. And this matters, um, you know, partly because these are important concepts and we like to measure them, but of course not all of us are, you know, maybe social scientists of a traditional flavor. Maybe we're interested in um, doing something like a machine learning task. And this might implicitly use something like a credit score or gender or, you know, pick your favorite construct. Um, and we have a, sort of a similar, well-defined, linear set of tasks. Uh, so we, I'm, I borrowed this, a similar version of this from uh, Eric Corbett's, but we can, we can argue about sort of what exact steps we want here. But we might go from having some kind of task or goal, we might define our data, maybe do some pre-processing, 
to decide what model we're going to use, train it, maybe make some assumptions during inference, generate some output, those might um, end up looking like measurements, and then make some decision, maybe to serve this ad or to uh, um, uh, give you a loan and so on. And, you know, we have this other linear process where we go from this uh, unobserved theoretical construct to operationalization, which in theory is the same, but what we actually observe is that the, both the values that we um, embed in our understandings of these constructs and the assumptions we make about these constructs are actually embedded throughout this whole machine learning pipeline through uh, what we believe we're representing, what types of decisions we're trying to make, and what steps we'll take in order to achieve those. And even more, uh, if we're thinking about where the steps of uh, how we're going to assume an operationalization is going to be, then we're similarly going to have to show up across steps in this pipeline, um, whether it's decisions about you know, assumptions we can make in the inference or the data cleaning process to what types of output we actually would like, what we're actually measuring. So what we see is actually, even though there's this underlying process of measurement going on in basically every setting, uh, it's really mixed throughout the whole process of the machine learning pipeline. And in some ways, we're actually throwing out this information that's kind of obscuring what's going on and these values and decisions that we're making underneath. So if we want to sort of unpack those assumptions, we really have to consider the measurement process underneath. And so really, given that this is so well embedded in the machine learning pipeline, um, we know that this is there, but we're necessarily, we're obscuring this process, and we need instead some way to actually unpack these assumptions. So today, I'll introduce some ways to help us tease this apart, how this applies in real settings, in particular doing this with the language and tools of construct validity and reliability. Um, and noting that this is usually an implicit process within many machine learning systems. And this is uh, extra of concern. Many of the undesirable behaviors that we often are on the lookout for trying to prevent with our various systems that we might present here often emerge from mismatches between our uh, theoretical understanding of a construct, our operationalization, or some theoretical notion. And I'll return to that point. Um, but we won't be able to diagnose or even prevent these harms if we don't have a way to talk about them, if we obscure the process that we're on. And so this borrows from a range of fields and intellectual histories, and we've combined several traditions as well as some of our own with uh, where we believe the fairness, accountability, and transparency community could benefit the most. And finally, we're going to, uh, my uh, colleague Sue Lin, We'll introduce the language to help disentangle some of these notions of bias, fairness, and harms. We're going to work through two case studies from natural language processing, thinking about where in text models and the bias mitigation world, how we might use these lessons for measurement to help us there, and overall for the field. So coming back to this process, let's say we're interested in measuring. I just want to sort of give us some tools for thinking about measurement models, and then we'll back off to um, how we might evaluate them and how we might evaluate them within existing pipelines. But so starting with a very simple measurement model, um, let's consider measuring height. So this might be a very straightforward kind of construct. Um, we might sort of have some general idea of what we consider to be height. Um, and if we're going to measure it, we're going to assume some fixed theoretical understanding of height and operationalize that. Um, and so specifically, we'll operationalize this theoretical construct H as little h. Um, and even in that operationalization, we have some choices. Um, I might decide that depending on your posture or the height of my hair or the height of my shoes, if this actually counts towards my height. Um, if we think about a baby, you, I guess you sort of you measure their length, <laughs> not their height. Um, and depending on sort of mobility tools or measuring tools, um, you're going to come to different types of representations. And those representations come with our sort of um, trying to map what we're observing from the real world to what we understand height to be. Um, and so these are uh, what David Hand calls representational measurements. Measurements are sort of drawing from something sort of what we would say observable, but arguably sort of fits within this uh, framework as well. And just to bring this to some notation that some machine learning people might be interested in, 
to think about how we might represent the process of our um, operationalized but unobservable uh, little h from uh, so this is a, a plate diagram. So, uh, so from our hidden variable h, we might take, say, a big N number of observations, which are possibly noisy. We can describe a measurement error model, which would describe that noise. Uh, we're going to take N of these measurements, um, uh, uh, N of these observations, the real world, from h hat, and we might take the average, say, and call that our estimate of this underlying um, construct height. And this is our, sort of having operationalized it this way, this is the way we can get to this. So this is all sort of producing a lot of extra language and extra baggage, but that's because I want to build us towards some more familiar looking and more complex types of models. We might be sort of on board with how we use a ruler. Um, we might even be okay with how we might uh, perhaps describe a measurement error model on top of that. Um, but actually, we can quickly get to some of the examples we might be interested in here. So rather than, say, taking a ruler, I could say, oh, here's a data set where people actually self-report their height. Um, so say on a dating site where people uh, can choose to list their own height, um, this might be a good uh, measure of, of what height is. But you know, uh, it turns out there are some systematic differences between what people actually report about themselves and what um, they actually sort of are in real life. And so what we would end up having is actually a systematic error that not only goes, um, uh, is apparent across the data, but actually is um, associated with some kind of sensitive attribute. So, uh, and you know, there's previous work from social psychology which suggests that, you know, this might be an intentional deception, whether self-reporting your income, say, or your height. So even still, we can let these sort of social values sneak in. So speaking of income, uh, we're going to use this as a running example, um, thinking about what I'm going to call socioeconomic status or SES. And this represents roughly your position in society, your level of opportunity, your sort of uh, opportunity to um, access. It can include cultural or economic advantage. And roughly this is sort of social class or um, how we might think about certain kinds of social stratification. And so one way we could think about measuring this is actually going from uh, some hidden variable, uh, SES, and actually we have some other hidden variable, which is income. We're actually going to have to operationalize. We're going to operationalize income in a very simple way. We're going to assume we perfectly observe it. It's fine, it's our model, we made it up, we told you what the assumptions are, we can uh, evaluate that later. But from here, we can evaluate, we have this idea of SES, and we're saying that when I observe income, that is equal to your SES. So if you make $100,000 a year, or $10 a year, doesn't matter what those numbers are, that's your scale. Um, and we can come up with all sorts of kinds of um, fancier or simple models that go within this, but really we're saying we are interested in this idea and we have the simple observation and that represents this. And you might have another word for how you might think about measuring SES using income. So just a note of terminology, uh, a word that comes up a lot at this conference, um, we might call income here as a proxy for SES. And actually, proxies are always referring to measurement models of some kind. Uh, often they're simple ones where we're substituting one variable for another, but really any kind of model where we could insert this kind of predictive task would allow us to do that. Um, and furthermore, there's an unstated assumption here. So often uh, we're describing, say, this is a proxy for race without saying, say, what we are actually, the context or the conditions under which we believe race to be a specific construct or what we believe SES to be or what we're actually trying to um, represent at the construct level. So we're often sort of burying this level of our assumptions at the theoretical construct level uh, into an unstated assumption behind our simple measurement model. We also have a familiar example that we wanted to borrow from computer science. Um, so some of you computer scientists might be familiar with topic models, which actually similarly conflate the construct that you're trying to measure 
with the thing that you call it, so with the, the way you operationalize it. So um, roughly a cartoon of how we might expect um, topics, this hidden construct inside of our documents to show up. We might describe, say, a probabilistic model where each topic is some distribution over words and each document is drawn from a mixture of topics and each word is drawn from those topics, which is obviously a very accurate model of language and how we write and how we speak. Um, but this really gives us a way to say, we would like to infer and back out what we're calling topics and what we're backing out is actually representing the construct topics. But we, since we've completed what we're interested in measuring, sort of some notion of what a document is about with what this whole model process is uh, working on estimating, we actually miss this opportunity to articulate that layer of assumptions. And so uh, just because we can, you know, we have plenty of ways to represent each of these models. Um, you know, we can put math to it and we uh, are implicitly stating our assumptions about what we believe topics to be. But we would like to evaluate these, not just because, say, we're interested in having good topic models or measuring height very well. Um, we'd like to really be able to use, now that we've teased apart these concepts of, say, some underlying construct versus what we're actually observing in the real world and how we're measuring it, uh, we want to ask about our measurement models. Are they meaningful? Are they useful? Um, are they doing what they think we should? Um, are they going to cause harm? And that's often something we're we would like to be concerned about, especially if we are, you know, working for, I mean, just in general, <laughs> I'll, I'll go with that. Um, and so really what we're going to introduce here is going to be borrowing from a number of different traditions, but what we would really like is um, not just, say, a checklist, but really something that helps us generatively think about how would we assess this? How would we demonstrate that we're doing what we say we're doing? And how can we demonstrate that this is meaningful? So I'm going to use construct validity as an umbrella term. Um, this really comes from a range of different fields over many years. So we're actually drawing from decades of political science, political methodology, education testing literature, psychology, statistics, um, and bringing it over to this literature. And um, we've combined those results in our paper there. And so I want to introduce the framework that we have brought together as we think is most relevant to uh, construct validity for this community. And furthermore, to unpacking the assumptions that are already built into all of the models that we're using to begin with. So we're going to focus on seven types of validity. Um, uh, these are our choices that we've combined in a number of ways. They draw from a few different traditions and I'm going to walk through them both to give you a sense of how we can use them to assess our models as well as um, what they would tell us about, say, our working example, for example, um, SES and income. So the first one's kind of easy. It's kind of a sniff test. Uh, we would say that, you know, um, you know, does what we're saying we're measuring basically mean what we think it does? You know, uh, is what I'm thinking of as socioeconomic status reasonably related to income? Sure. Okay. I, you know, I can move on from there. Uh, you can find tasks where you don't even have that, and it's a great warning that you should really consider your assumptions about what you're actually trying to measure. Um, so this is... Uh, you know, easy to test, it's really a sort of qualitative thing. I could say, yeah, say, um, if I was using uh, income, a billionaire has a different income than a barista, and they're probably sort of at different stations in what we imagine the sort of socioeconomic status space to be. So we can move forward. Content validity actually helps us think about what we believe our underlying construct to be. So with socioeconomic status, we might want to say, we have some theoretical understanding of what socioeconomic status is. I would also have to assert that um, either there is uh, some general, either theoretical or in practice, agreed upon understanding of what that would be, or if there is some fundamental uh, disagreement within our understanding of that, uh, what type of um, definition or understanding are we going to use? So this is really sort of what is at the core of what I'm representing. And uh, does my operationalization fully capture what I am claiming is that construct? 
So with SES, when I introduced it, I sort of gave this away because, you know, maybe we're actually interested in um, access to education, uh, wealth, which is not represented by income, uh, cultural ties, cultural capital. Maybe I'm interested in something else that's not actually represented by solely income alone. And so this would mean that uh, I'm necessarily lacking on some of this content validity. Even if I have some sort of rough notion of what that construct is, I'm probably not representing all of the relevant aspects of it within that definition. Convergent validity is, is actually a kind of task that looks a little bit more similar to uh, types of tasks we already do. And I think thinking about it in this context helps us um, reason about it a little bit more. So in convergent validity, we're going to ask if other sort of agreed upon measures or other measures that we think are sort of valid in representing what we're interested in, do they match our intended constructs? So this could be, oh, um, I expect, you know, this to be correlated. So we're actually going to borrow from uh, the National Committee on Vital and Health Statistics from the Department of Health and Human Services. They're really interested in measuring things like socioeconomic status because they're worried about things like housing and human health. And so for us, we might actually draw what their estimates of the population's socioeconomic status is and compare that to our measure using income. And there we actually might find um, you know, maybe a significant agreement. I know they also use income in their model, so they'll be correlated that way. Um, but we might find quickly there are certain gaps that we don't have. So maybe on certain populations, we're doing particularly well or particularly poorly. For example, we might find a group of college students with very low reported income, but high educational status, high access to wealth, um, and so on. So we might be able to use this, this as a quantitative measure to help us qualitatively explore our model and our modeling assumptions. So we're building up these definitions. We'll get to a sort of more applied active um, version later, but bear with me. Um, and so I've already described convergent validity might be, again, we're trying to find something that's correlated. You know, we believe these because other things are real. Um, discriminant validity helps us assert that we're not measuring something we don't intend to. Um, so, uh, but you know, to the degree that two things are related, um, we want to make sure that those things are related. So, for example, let's say um, I'm looking at uh, two people who um, receive the same monthly wages but, every, but are on a different pay schedule. So if I ask you on the first of the month or on the last of the month um, what your income in the last month was, I'm going to get this sort of artificial variation, which is just you know, when your paycheck arrives. So that would be some kind of step in the measurement process, something that's really unrelated to what we're trying to get at, if you're paid on the first or the 30th. Um, on the other hand, uh, so that would reveal measurement error. On the other hand, uh, it's interesting working with SES because actually we expect that to be related to really almost everything. This impacts effectively every aspect of our life. But we might want to use this to reason about, say, persistent wage gaps due to gender and race and how we can think about access to opportunity versus sort of simple uh, gender versus income types of models. So for example, how is your neighborhood related to, or how is the school that you grew up with related to that opportunity? Predictive validity uh, is also, again, sort of quite uh, familiar. We might ask, you know, can we use this measurement model if we think SES is related to something we might be predicted down the road, either um, say, are you going to click on this ad or buy this product or um, sort of appear in this other kind of setting, I might be able to use this kind of outside data, which I didn't learn from, to validate that what I'm doing sort of does what I expect it to do. This is a, we can, this is a sort of fairly common task, uh, but it's really, um, but it's really sort of articulating what we think we're measuring with the kinds of settings that we're interested in. And so say I might be interested in um, and it doesn't have to be sort of downstream, but I might say, okay, I think that whether or not you buy a Tesla or whether or not you're mentioned in the New York Times or whether or not you're going to apply for a government, government assistance program, those all might be things that I did not explicitly learn on, but that I might be able to predict using my model of uh, SES, using income. 
And so, again, we might find, be able to use this to unpack some small systematic differences, but really this helps us reason about whether or not we're measuring the right thing with respect to the types of questions that we're interested in. And finally, hypothesis validity helps us put our measurement into context. So um, if we have operationalized our construct in a way that we think is correct and meaningful, we should really be able to uncover sort of the kinds of social facts about the world that we would expect to see. So for example, again, typical uh, hypotheses and significant empirical evidence suggests that um, uh, lower SES, having lower SES leads to worse health, worse health outcomes, at least in the US, and I would presume that generalizes beyond. Um, and so this is actually sort of uh, then something we can test. We can relate, okay, does your reported income relate to some kind of health status? Uh, and this is, again, this is not how it should be, but this is the thing that we have found in the world. Um, and so this might, in general, say in the lower and upper ends of the distribution, maybe be correct. But we might also find, again, certain groups, say college students with significant access to wealth, who are also very healthy, but effectively uh, no income. Similarly, we could think about uh, being mentioned in the New York Times as some kind of representation of cultural capital. So putting that aside, we could see if this is actually a question of income or if that's somewhere where, again, qualitatively, our model is missing something. And so finally, the, just the motivation for this is not just that we're sort of measuring what we say we are, but really that we could use this to ask other kinds of questions and that those arguments would be valid. So this is, does this tell me something that I can uh, move beyond these single tasks with? And finally, this one is sort of interesting and different. It comes from the educational testing literature, um, really out of the 80s and 90s. So I want to take some steps to build this up because in some ways it's a cop out to say like, oh yes, and we added on one. We care about consequences now. Let's go. <laughs> um, but I really want to tease apart that um, yes, we're, this is helping us capture what are the downstream consequences, which has uh, normative language and normative concerns built into it, but it's fundamentally an aspect of validity. And Samuel Messick really uh, spent much of his career arguing this um, in the educational testing literature. So he worked for the Educational Testing Service, which, do, which makes things like the GRE, actual tests that have some direct impact on some outcomes, although maybe not anymore. Uh, and he was concerned about the fact that once you um, create a test, this, the way that it's used, the way that's interpreted, the way that um, people sort of take some score seriously or don't, or the way that it creates opportunities or does not, um, can really fundamentally change the definition of the um, measurement itself. So that is to say how these measurements are interpreted. So if I say, oh wow, they're a risk score of 10, um, or a look at their GPA, so high, uh, I might be able to then use that as you know, something I'm a ga game. So if I'm a college, I might move towards grade inflation so my students get the best jobs. Um, and there's a number of types of feedback loops and types of ways this may show up. So um, one might be with automation bias, is if we believe that um, these scores, because they came from an algorithm uh, are somehow more valid or unbiased or, you know, we ran them through some tests so they're not biased and therefore it is more valid than what you could say, um, we might actually be changing the landscape which we're trying to measure. Uh, this might also show up with certain kinds of feedback loops, um, not just incentives, but if we're creating the data that we're then training on, say for predictive policing, if we send police to uh, certain areas and make arrests there and return to those places, we're going to um, increase the frequency that we observe in those places, leading to systematic shifts. Um, and finally, we know that this also shifts incentives. So as I said, with the educational testing or um, teachers manipulating grades or having grade inflation, uh, what we see in all sorts of settings is what's sometimes called Goodhart's Law, that when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. Um, which is to say, now we have something to optimize for, and I'm going to go for that. 
This is also kind of what the show The Good Place is about. You know, there are a lot of ways that we've explored this idea, and this really is sort of insidious across organizations, across education, across the kinds of systems that we're generally um, running among ourselves and encoding uh, technically. So overall, what this all points to is a number of ways to ask some questions about what we've done, what we've assumed, how we're operationalizing it, what we're measuring in practice. But I want to point out some sort of higher level lessons that we learned from this. One is that these are both quantitative and quality, qualitative ways to establish validity. So these are um, quantitative and qualitative tests, different types of arguments to argue that for a given context, we are answering the question we say we are answering from the data that we are working with, from what we've defined. And so this means that you know, this is always sort of relative to the context. This is um, what question are we trying to answer? Are we answering that question well? Are we predicting something because that's what we care about? Or is it only appropriate in certain contexts? And so that means really, there is no best. There is never fully validated models. We have never finished this. Um, because in any inherently social, political, cultural, economic, organizational, et cetera, task, um, there is always going to be this type of contextual question where underlying, even if we did not state them, there are these strong um, values embedded into the assumptions that are made. So we really need some way to unpack how those assumptions got in and the degree to which we are um, accurately or adequately um, capturing those issues. And finally, I, I like this quote from David Hand, a great scholar on measurement, um, that these measurements and how they're defined both reflect structure in the natural world and impose structure upon it. And I, to me, this really resonates with the kind of computational context where there has been somewhat less of this discussion of measurement, but really we're trying to capture things in the world and by encoding them, we create more structure. And I would be remiss, there's uh, a related issue which I'll spend less time on here, is the notion of reliability, is, which is roughly, if construct validity was, are we measuring the right thing? Reliability is roughly how well do we do? Um, or sort of what's the variance around this, this notion? Um, so this comes from the notion of, say, inter-rater reliability. If I ask you what happened or you what happened, do we get the same kind of answer? Um, here we might be interested in test retest. If I run this on my laptop or you run this on a larger machine, are we going to get the same answers? Um, are we really sensitive to certain kinds of initial uh, seeding conditions or is that intentional? This is really sort of the um, typical types of you know, either numerical or practical constraints that might exist on our data. And this can also come from just, say, overfitting. Um, the classic example for uh, uh, value-added evaluation of teachers, um, I've used a model where you know, one teacher who is you know, a sort of uh, model in the community uh, received a score of 96 on this test one year and then six the next year. And it's really this model that's just sort of wildly overfitting to these small variations that's not necessarily well specified. And there you actually might find it's actually just the fact that the test is guessing numbers all over the fact, all over the place, that means it's maybe it's trying to get the right thing. Maybe we made all the right assumptions, but based on the conditions, it's actually not reliable for the tests that we're interested in. I want to bring us to one, I'm going to draw on a couple sort of core examples to our community without rehashing everything we've done in all of the past years. Um, so I want to revisit briefly what we've been discussing as um, how we might evaluate the measurement process in a conflict that's well known within this community, say looking at the compass algorithm to understand recidivism risk scores. So one could argue that the construct here that really is implicitly being measured is some kind of risk to society. We can argue about whether it, where precisely within the criminal justice system it's actually claiming to do that, but that's sort of roughly what we're trying to get at. So already these systems exist and we're just backing out um, what's underlying it. And we already know that uh, this is generally operationalized, whether it's risk to site or violent risk, um, through the likelihood of reoffending. 
And here the measurement model is actually using re-arrest, not say re-offense, because uh, this is what our observations are. So we already know that that's sort of one of our core issues. But we can really put this into context by backing out how can we use the language of validity to assess this model, to assess these past um, disagreements, to actually engage with um, what values are embedded in this, where those assumptions live, and how we would possibly intervene on them. So uh, I'm actually just going to highlight a few types of validity just to show how strongly this gets at these different kinds of issues that we um, have can conflate if we don't fully separate what we're trying to measure with what we're actually doing. So first, we've already said, you know, being arrested is not the same thing as doing some, uh, as reoffending without being arrested. So we already know that we um, have these sort of subpar measurements that are based on all sorts of other types of attributes. Um, we can also assert that, you know, maybe risk to society is a questionable goal, and maybe that's actually not what reoffending within the existing legal system is at this moment. Maybe that's actually not quite what we mean. Um, but that would be a disconnect between what we understand as this construct of interest, what this risk to society is, versus what we're actually measuring in the process. So we've operationalized it using, again, this likelihood of reoffending. We can also look at other attributes, which may be related to the types of things we're predicting, but perhaps in ways that we do not intend to be encoding into um, our models. So for example, if we observe, say, a uh, different performance or uh, stronger relationships with, say, race or socioeconomic status or mental health, and those are sort of um, interfering with the sort of scores that we observe, in not the way that we would expect them to, perhaps this means that there's something qualitatively wrong with how we're thinking about this problem. And perhaps by actually digging into what we actually intend to be measuring versus what, say, a police system is better at handling or not, uh, we can actually get at what we're intending to do. Uh, we know from ProPublica and all sorts of other settings that we know also many of these computational systems uh, we, we observe differences in performance by race. So this is actually not predictive validity overall, but predictive validity broken down by these different categories. And finally, I just wanted to highlight consequ consequential validity here as well. We already know that we're training on historical racist training data if we're designing um, a an algorithm from previous historical arrest data. Um, and we know this has all sorts of feedback loops with who gets targeted both by neighborhood and, and groups. We also, we know that handing these scores to um, various systems, we can see both automation bias where people trust these scores or actually um, ways that people step aside in systematic ways to, um, to circumvent these systems. And finally, we know this is sort of a fundamental piece and actually a sort of a high impact area of how we imagine governance and the criminal justice system to work. And so if we want to understand what we're actually would like to measure, um, we have to either uh, interrogate our assumptions about what we would like to do in those settings, or uh, at least specify that within this particular set of goals or within this particular set of system, here's how we would proceed. So this lets us unpack what's been going on inside of say, many articles that write about COPPIS, but why I think especially this automation bias, governance, criminal justice point is so compelling is, you know, there is all sorts of argument about sort of which types of measurements you could use to say whether or not um, this was a useful algorithm. But I'll say um, COPPIS in their discussion of validity, ostensibly of this type, they really assert that they are using risk scales that are assessed with an objective method. And so this really sides up the fact that there were assumptions that were made from which an objective method was done, but the initial assumptions about what goes into this, what arrests are, what offending is, um, what violence is, is already built in in the first place. You may have seen this outside. <laughs> uh, didn't plan for that. Um, but it's a good question. Uh, in part, 
because it is an unobserved theoretical construct. Um, and actually, even worse, better, who knows, um, it's actually what we would call an essentially contested construct which is to say we have no fundamental agreement about what fairness actually is. And so we know that you know, this can be in different contexts, what fair means at different time periods, what's considered fair. We know that we've been uh, disagreeing with each other about what fairness really is for literally thousands of years. Um, and so this really means that we're, we're working with something that really embodies this kind of... Uh, disagreement. And so uh, we also, relatedly, we have sort of notions of justice and equity, and maybe that's actually what we're aiming for when we're talking about fairness. So these are all sort of related ideas and things that we would really have to come to some kind of agreement on if we wanted to measure them. But we measure it anyways, and we have, we're not asserting to have solved um, what philosophically, theoretically, socially fairness is, but, in, but we still move forward and measure it. So to the extent that we do wish to actually measure fairness after all, we can and we should use these tools of measurement modeling. And this lets us um, assert what our assumptions about what we believe fairness to be in a way that we're going to use and evaluate our systems. Um, and from there, uh, say, this is how we're going to measure for that definition of fairness. And then we can explore how well it does in practice and what this really means and the degree which this helps or violates things like our notions of justice or equity. And this uh, really is um, a way to bring together our values of what we believe that we would like to measure, what we believe we would like to optimize for. And uh, again, Samuel Misuk, who brought this idea of uh, consequential validity, uh, cites Kronbach in saying, that making these choices about consequences as well as what types of evidence are available and how we might come to these decisions, these are really judgments that are embodying trade-offs and not truths. So there is still no underlying truth to what we are believing fairness to be, but we are making decisions about whether we are op optimizing for a certain notion of, say, equity. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so, um, Something, an activity that happens frequently in this domain and others is we have some precise mathematical definition of fairness. And this is great. This lets us um, test things. It lets us prove things. It's very productive. Um, and it really does give us a framework to work with, but it still is embedded. There is this implicit measurement process regardless. And the thing that we sort of crucially need even though there is that precision that is representing some specific operationalization of fairness, we still need a theoretical argument for what is being operationalized. So specifically, I can say that I'm representing this particular type of fairness, and that's represented through this equation, and that is perfectly precise, but I need to uh, fundamentally argue that this property truly does measure fairness or unfairness in a way that matches my theoretical understanding of what I'm saying fairness is. And so this helps us take apart these different concerns, um, which are different. So we have these embedded normative concerns about sort of what construct are we actually operationalizing or what construct should we be operationalizing for? Does, um, you know, if we're interested in this type of balance or this type of metric, were you really trying to get at um, one notion of fairness? For whom? Across what context? Um, do we care about other things like justice? And furthermore, we can put those questions aside. We can sort of articulate our assumptions and say, this is what I am measuring. It measures this idea of fairness. This is what I intend to be doing. This is the construct that I care about. And so even having that fixed, I still have to assert that the way that I've operationalized this, this equation that I'm using, does capture this construct in the way that I've articulated. So even if I'm going for um, this particular notion or tradition of fairness, I still have to say the equation over here in this context here in this model is actually capturing that completely. And so uh, evaluating the validity of this type of an operationalization really helps us get at um, are we really achieving that or what assumptions did we have to make in the process. And that helps us tease apart where these values sneak in, the different la layers of disagreement, and even though 
were sort of hypothetically adjust the sort of precise mathematical theoretical argument, um, we can help get at different parts of this process. And truly, uh, this process validation can reveal both different implicit constructs, say, um, when we talk about fairness and possibility results, often it's because we're actually going for different understandings of fairness. Um, but it also helps us understand what we are and are not capturing in those models or what assumptions have to meet in the process. So uh, the theory can be there, but we still need this process. And overall, what I would say is, you know, inescapably so, that measurement is everywhere. So whether we articulate it or not, um, these assumptions are often implicitly made. And furthermore, that often the undesirable behavior we're interested in arises from what I would call mismatches in this process. So one place this could emerge is between, say, construct and operationalization. Say, maybe uh, recent arrests is not actually what I mean by risk to society. This is somewhere where this kind of uh, implicit mismatch is that's not necessarily articulated can lead to real harms or just other types of undesirable behavior. This can also come from uh, different theoretical understandings of constructs. If I truly believe that this is what the construct of race means versus some other definition, uh, work that expands from different understandings will actually proceed differently. And so finally, validity and reliability really give us the tools to help us interrogate this process, which is always there but generally obscured. And when we collapse construct and operationalization or even construct operationalization and measurement, we really lack, miss the opportunity to unpack what those assumptions are and where those problems can emerge. And so I just wanted to zoom back out because this means we're since this um, language helps us see where the, this undesirable behavior can emerge from, we really need this language in order to diagnose problems that exist, potentially prevent them. And so I wanted to open us up to the next section um, where we can now actually use this to disentangle notions of bias, of fairness, of harms, and look to NLP for some uh, motivating examples. So I'm going to take some water and let... Uh, so we're going to take the space. Does the clicker work or no? No. Okay. <laughs> I'm stuck here. Okay, cool. Hi. Um, so um, my name is Sue Lin, and we're now going to turn to the domain of natural language processing, which is what I spend most of my time working on. Um, so in the context of language, there are a lot of unobservable theoretical constructs that we might be interested in thinking about. Um, so at one level, researchers might be interested in things like, might actually be implicitly measuring things like sentiment, what's the sentiment of this piece of text, what's um, the toxicity of this piece of text, what language is it in, sociolinguists are moving towards thinking about languages as the constructs, um, to what are the topics as we've seen, um, you know, regional variation, all these kinds of things, you know, that are sort of analogous to what, um, to things like height and socioeconomic status. And then we might kind of like zoom out and think about measuring things like gender bias or racial bias or age bias or any number of biases, fairnesses, you know, harms. Um, and this is analogous to Abby's discussion about measuring fairness. So in the rest of the tutorial, we're going to focus on applying uh, the measurement modeling toolbox to these questions of measuring bias in NLP systems. But as a language person, I do want to say that we can and should apply the measurement modeling process to all these other things that we do with our language systems all the time. So in the last uh, few years, there's been quite a lot of work emerging, looking at undesirable behavior emerging from NLP systems. And usually what this work does is it proposes an approach for quantifying bias in an NLP system. Um, so what measurement modeling does is it gives us the toolbox to reframe this. Um, so essentially work that quantifies bias is providing a measurement model, right? Um, and then we can ask, um, measure models of what? What, when researchers are quantifying bias in NLP systems, what are they measuring? What are they getting at? 
so measurement modeling enables to ask a couple of really important questions. One is, what constructs are NLP approaches to bias operationalizing? Are they all getting at the same thing? Uh, are there quite different things that are being operationalized all kind of under the umbrella term of bias? Um, it uh, asks, we, we can ask kind of what constructs should work on bias to be operationalizing, right? So what normative concerns do we really want to measure? Um, in requiring us to articulate these constructs, measurement modeling allows slash encourages us to theorize about these normative concerns separately from how we're measuring them, right? So it kind of opens up to these really important sort of normative discussions. And then we can ask, uh, much as, uh, you know, um, much as Abby has, uh, are the proposed measurements well matched, you know, using our new tools of validity and reliability? Are our measurements good at measuring our proposed constructs of interest? So for the NLP domain, there are a ton of ways to break down bias into more useful granular constructs that NLP papers might be getting at. Uh, so here, we're, we just, we're going to propose a subset of these. Um, so the set of constructs we're going to think about for the purposes of this tutorial are what we think of as representational harms. So we can imagine that a lot of NLP systems, like machine translation systems or sentiment analysis systems, um, they don't directly allocate, for the most part, opportunities or resources. Rather, they give rise to you know, different kinds of what we might think of as representational harms. So this is a subset of um, these harms. It's not exhaustive, but it's a handy set of um, things. So here we've included stereotyping, um, so which is sometimes defined as a fixed, overgeneralized belief about a particular group of people. Denigration, so the, we might define this as applying a label that has a long history of being purposefully used to denigrate and demean people. So one example of this outside the NLP domain is when Google Photos um, label pictures of uh, uh, African Americans as gorillas. Uh, quality of service, which kind of gets at performance differences um, between text about different groups or between text uh, written by different groups of people. Um, and, you know, something, and public participation, which is something like um, diminishing you know, people's ability to participate in public discourse or democratic processes. And what's really useful about these is that uh, these are all things that might be collapsed under the term bias, but they're really different things, and collapsing them under the same term really obscures the fact that they are very different, and uh, they're really valuable to examine separately. And separating them also kind of, I mean, by looking at these just definitions and thinking about these separately, it kind of hints at like the theoretical lineages we might lean on to really do a good job understanding these, right? So social psychologists and sociolinguists and sociologists and, um, uh, and a lot of other folks have actually thought a lot about these things, and separating them out, uh, we can kind of lean on and draw in that knowledge. So we're going to dig into two specific NLP case studies, uh, so two approaches, um, recent approaches to examining bias in NLP systems. Um, that think about, uh, and we're going to think about the process, of, like we're going to think about what harms are operationalized and how they are operationalized by these approaches to quantifying bias in NLP systems. So the first of these is something that is probably maybe well known to a lot of people in this room. It's bias in word embeddings. So word embeddings are a cornerstone of modern NLP uh, tools. Um, they underlie pretty much all modern NLP systems, I would say. So in word embeddings, uh, in this framework, every word in a vocabulary gets mapped to a dense, like real valued vector in a vector space. Um, so this is really appealing because it's been shown that these word embedding spaces capture really desirable linguistic regularities. So there's actually, they capture in a linear way um, uh, semantic relationships. So actually there's like a nice geometric relationship in many embedding spaces between king and queen and man and woman. Um, there's also um, really nice morphological regularities. So in word embedding spaces capture things like geometric relationships like walked is to walking, as swam is to swimming, which you can might, might imagine is really handy for NLP systems. But they also capture not so desirable things, uh, regularities. So some analogies that pop out of many um, word embedding spaces are things like man is the programmer as woman is the homemaker, or uh, he is the physician as she is the registered nurse. And these are, uh, so one early study on this from a couple of years ago showed that after, after generating a bunch of analogies and showing them to um, Amazon Turk uh, annotators, about 40% of like the gender sensical analogies that are produced exhibit these kinds of uh, uh, undesirable relationships. 
So this is not the only approach uh, that's been taken to kind of looking at bad behavior arising from embedding spaces. So two other approaches have done this too, and I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of what they do, but um, one approach, which I'm going to call subspace rejection, is where you construct a binary gender direction in space, um, usually by subtracting the he and she, the vectors for he and she from each other. And you, take a, you construct a set of occupation words that you think ought to be gender neutral. So words like programmer and homemaker, nurse, physician, and so forth. Um, and then you can quantify the gender bias of the embedding space by taking the projection of these words onto the gender direction. So roughly, is programmer closer to he or to she? Um, and if overall most of your uh, you know, occupation words are closer to one than the other, this seems bad. And there's another approach that's pretty well known. It's called the word embedding association test. Um, it's a series of tests also for examining bias in embedding spaces. Um, so each test constructs four word sets. For example, um, so like for the second row in this table, um, this, this test constructs a set of male names, a set of female names, and a set of career-related words, and a set of family-related words. And the test asks what, uh, about the relative distance for example, between the male and from, of the male and female names from the career and family names, right? So if on average, let's say, your female names are closer to your uh, family words, right, than the male ones are, this is taken as evidence of gender bias in your space. So I, what I'd like to put to you is uh, an activity. Uh, so I'd like to ask, uh, I think uh, we'd like to consider kind of like three questions about these approaches to thinking about gender bias, so, or by actually not entirely gender bias. There's also racial bias in here. Um, what are, what underlying constructs, what harms are these approaches to de-biasing or identifying bias in word embedding spaces? What are they getting at? Like, what are the underlying constructs? Um, and we, the, you know, the ones that we, here are some that we've talked about. Um, what other harms what or other things might have been operationalized if you're concerned about undesirable things arising from your embedding space? What else might we consider as important to measure? And then um, what are other approaches that we might have taken to measuring the things, you know, the constructs that we identify as being measured here? So I'm going to put that to you, maybe take a few minutes, talk to a neighbor about these. I won't like ask you to tell, report back to me, but you know, uh, I think it's very useful.
Alrighty. Alrighty. Okay. So, possibly, um, a lot of you might have identified these word, these approaches as getting at something like stereotyping. Um, but what's really, I think, valuable about this measurement modeling process is that we can really identify, you know, you think about, you know, ask the question, are these different approaches, are they getting at the same thing? What is the theoretical, their theoretical idea of gender stereotyping that they're kind of getting at, right? Because there were choices that were made here, like the words maybe that were selected, um, or, uh, you know, the idea of what even gender is, the fact that you can construct like a binary gender direction. Um, there were choices in, the in how these were operationalized um, that reflect a lot of embedded assumptions. Um, and reflect maybe that the people that you know folks who designed these tasks maybe had slightly different notions of what constitutes stereotyping um, or uh, har you know harms or biases arising from NLP systems, and it's nice to unpack these things. So our second example is uh, toxicity detection. So some tools, uh, there are a number of tools now, such as Google's Perspective API, but not limited to just pers the perspective, that take as input a piece of text and return a toxicity score. So a real value, you know, a number, um, you know, from one, you know, from zero to 100, how toxic is this piece of text? And, uh, you know, they have all these applications for things like um, content moderation online. And so recent work has actually found that tweets that have features of African American English are more likely to be given high toxicity scores than tweets that don't have these features. So side note, uh, African American English, um, for those who aren't familiar, is a variety of English that's uh, widely spoken in the United States. Um, it is uh, considered, it's well studied by sociolinguists, it's considered to be rule bound um, and perfectly grammatical, it's not bad English or slang, um, and it is, it's pretty well studied. Uh, and so this work has found that um, tweets that have some features of this variety um, are more likely to be given higher toxicity scores than tweets that aren't. So um, these are, so this handy, ta this table from the right is the, one of the main table results from this paper that found this. And what you can see here, it's um, for two different data sets, um, tweets that uh, have features of African American English are much more likely to be falsely identified as uh, offensive or abusive or hateful, I mean, depending on the classification scheme, um, than tweets that don't have these features. Um, so I'd like to put to you now a very similar question um, to think about, you know, what, what you know, this, this uh, approach to quantifying um, something that seems like a bad, uh, bad behavior emerging from an NLP system, um, what construct is being operationalized here um, what else, you know, knowing that maybe per, like, toxicity systems do this, what other harms or uh, behaviors might have been operationalized, and how might we actually go about operationalizing those things? So I'll give you a couple more minutes to think about this.
Okay. Okay. Um, so I, I wanted to point out a couple of things uh, that actually I learned a lot from trying to apply the measurement modeling process to thinking about um, these, approach, these approaches to quantifying bias in NLP systems. So one is that, um, for example, I think, you know, I think you might say that this approach here gets at something like, you know, performance differences or quality of service or something like that, right? Which is a very intuitive, um, you know, undesirable behavior that we might want to, um, that we want to kind of operationalize. Um, but that there are others, right? So for example, like if this is actually applied in a content moderation system, it might really, it might lead to like a public participation kind of harm, right? And conceptualizing this as part of the measure modeling process, really thinking about what it is that we want to measure, separately from how do we measure it, actually I think opens, opens us up to considering alternative things like trying to measure something like public participation, which might not immediately have occurred to us if we're just, let's measure bias. Another thing is that um, there are, you know, the measure modeling process really highlights um, you know, all the choices that are made in how these approaches are operationalized. So, for example, what constitutes gender stereotyping? Or in, the, in this case, and in the previous case, like what constitutes like, race? Right? So here, right, the, the, the claim of this paper is that there is racial disparity in how these systems operate, and that is measured through um, you know, like the presence of like, dialectal features in your language. Um, and in the previous oh, here, um, there is, it looks at racial disparity, but from, you know, by using European American and African American names, for example, right? So thinking about this as a, me as a measurement model that is operationalized really helps us identify the choices that were made in the creation of this measurement model um, and um, reflect on if that is really actually the thing that we're getting at, right? It might be. I mean, African American, like, the names might really be what you're getting at, but it is something worth uh, interrogating. And I also I want to highlight that I think there's a couple of papers actually at this conference, including a paper on critical race um, theory and algorithmic fairness that really gets at this question of you know thinking about how we are operationalizing like the, the central question of this measurement modeling process as we are trying to diagnose unfairnesses. So check it out. It's not our paper, but it looks really good. Um, so the last I. This is the last activity I promise. Um, <laughs> is uh, to I think uh, uh, to think about kind of how does this measurement, how the measurement process lives in uh, other automated systems that we might work with. Um, so for a number of systems, so concerning um, language, concerning vision, or concerning something else that um, machine learning uh, system, machine learning is often deployed in. Um, we, it, uh, we can think about how the measurement process lives in these systems. What kinds of constructs um, are we interested in with these, these systems? Either at the level of what are these systems directly measuring, maybe like gender or race or emotion, or kind of like what are we thinking about when we are thinking about, um, you know, at a higher level about unfairnesses or biases or harms within these systems. So um, pick your system of choice. Um, <laughs> and talk to your neighbor, or, you know, question mark, any system, yeah.
Okay. All right. So, what we really want uh, you to take away are really t from this are really two things. The first, measurement modeling as a process is everywhere. It's not something you can really out opt out of, right? You're doing it whether you like it or not. So you may as well, uh, you know, articulate it and surface your assumptions so that you can do a good job of it. So. The language of construct validity and reliability, we think, really give us the tools for interrogating this process that we do all the time. Um, and our ability to diagnose and prevent undesirable behavior, which often arises from kind of mismatches in this process, really depends on our ability to really formally interrogate this process. And the second thing I want to uh, say, leave us with, is that measurement modeling um, reframes bias mitigation, right? Is it, does it make sense to talk about, you know, debiasing word embeddings or debiasing machine translation or something like that? And I would say no, um, because bias mitigation only, you know, bi mitigation only makes sense with respect to this, a specific construct, right, a sp specific normative concern, and a particular way of operationalizing that concern, right? So, um, uh, so you might really want you m might need to, for example, specify, you know, that you're concerned about stereotyping uh, or some kind of stereotyping in your embedding space, and how you're operationalizing that, and then it might make sense to say you know, to do bias with respect to that, right? But, um, you know, bias mitigation maybe uh, makes less sense. So in this tutorial, so um, recap, we introduced the language and tools of construct validity and reliability to kind of unpack this measurement process that's happening all the time. Um, we think that unde undesirable behavior can really emerge from mismatches in the measurement process. Um, but uh, the, this language newly kind of gives us the ability to diagnose or prevent these mismatches. And so we spent some time thinking about, you know, fairness and harms um, and kind of the constructs that we are, might be really concerned about in the process of uh, quantifying unfairnesses, biases. Um, we taught, we uh, presented two case studies from NLP and hopefully part of the lessons from measurement. Uh, so as you depart, I encur we encourage you very strongly to think about how this measurement process, you know, might be employed in the work that you do, how it might be used to kind of hopefully disentangle some things. So thank you very much. So uh, the measurement and fairness paper, as uh, Abby said, is already up. It is at, uh, it is at, that, web at that link, right? It is there. It is there and it's on archive and the other paper in debuggy debiasing will be up, fingers crossed, very shortly at the same place. So, thank you. Thank you, clap twice. <laughs>